And when I was in the ninth grade, my parents, you know how people threaten to leave the country? Like, oh, if Reagan is elected, we're leaving the country. Mm -hmm. They left the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I spent a couple years in um, Nigeria when I was a kid. Oh my God. Yes, I had very ideal. They were political. And people always think you have political parents, that you have angry parents, mm -hmm. but they were idealistic parents. Mm -hmm. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the voice to have. Books really saved my life. Good evening, everyone. Tiari's at that fabulous stage of writing where they can't even list all the awards. They just say many awards. <laughs> you know, she's really good. Um, I'm really, really excited to be here to talk about American marriage. Um, at the end, of course, there'll be questions, but for now, I get to ask all the questions I've been waiting to ask Tiari since I read the book. Um, and I wanted to start with, uh, I had read that you had done a lot of research for this book, but that it ended up coming down to a conversation that you overheard. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the research and then the conversation that started the book. Okay. Um, first, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so happy to meet you, and I'm so happy to be here. An American Marriage is a novel that took me six years to write. And I decided that I wanted to use my fourth novel to write about something other than myself. I had written three other novels that kind of touched on my own autobiography. And I decided that it was time for me to try to address some of the things going on in the world today that are important to me. Mm. And so I wrote a grant, and I was accepted to Harvard for the year to do some research. And I did all this research on the issue of mass incarceration in the US. And I was particularly interested in wrongful incarceration and what happens to exonerees, et cetera. And I did all this research and I learned things that like kept me up at night. I learned like heartbreaking statistics. But I was always trained as a writer to write about to write about people and their problems, not problems and their people. Mm. And so I felt like I had a problem, but I didn't have people because I'm a storyteller. You know, I'm not an ethnographer, I'm not a sociologist, and I didn't know what to do. The Harvard people wanted us to give a presentation of our work, and I had been working, but I had nothing to show for my time but like a bunch of like really angry index cards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so I traveled from Boston, which is in the north, to my hometown of Atlanta, which is in the south, to visit my mother, as I do when I'm feeling upset. And while I was there, I also um, went to the mall to do some shopping, something else I do when I'm feeling upset. <laughs> we have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then while I was at the mall, I went to the food court to have a little snack. Yep. <laughs> Another thing that I do <laughs> when I'm yep. a little upset. And while I was there at the food court, I saw a couple. And they were clearly in love and in trouble. Mm. And I heard the woman say, clear as a bell, she said, Roy, you know you wouldn't have waited on me for seven years. And I looked at, I'm nosy, <laughs> I looked at them. <laughs> I felt like she knew it, he knew it, and I knew it. That... <laughs> He would not have waited on her for seven years. Absolutely. But then he turned to her and he said, he looked really annoyed. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. This wouldn't have happened to you in the first place. And, you know, it felt like once again, the three of us knew that he was also right. And I know that I have a novel when I have a situation where the characters are both right, yet they disagree. Mm. Mm. Right? <laughs> Um, I, one of the things that's really powerful about this novel is it's actually told from multiple perspectives. And so we have Roy, we have Celestial, and then we have Andre. And I was curious about the choice behind that structure because you could have told it obviously in third person, you could have told it from one person and not the others. So for authors, I'm always curious about the choices. So what was it about those three voices that felt essential to conveying this story? Well, you know, part of the reason it took me so many years to write the book is that I couldn't decide on point of view. And I do think that point of view is the most significant thing about any story, a story you read or just a story you know in life. Mm -hmm. The point of view from which is told shapes a story. 
I wrote the story the first time from Celestial's point of view, you know, the young woman whose husband is wrongfully incarcerated. I wrote it from top to bottom from her point of view, but I didn't feel like I had the whole story. And everyone was giving me a lot of pressure to, you know, tell more about his story. And I kind of resisted it because I really wanted to talk about the way this affects women. Mm. But, and the, the pressure, it's like the pressure to write his story seemed to be the very pressure that I thought I was writing against. Mm. So I felt like when, with that, but I felt finally that I had to try and tell his story because it was such a part of the story. Mm. And I came to that when I heard Claudia Rankin read from Citizen and she read a line from Citizen that said, what happens to you doesn't belong to you, only half concerns you, it's not yours, not yours only. Mm -hmm. And when I heard her read that, I realized that she was right, that I couldn't just tell the story just with her voice. So I went home and I rewrote the whole book from his point of view. What? Which wasn't as hard as you would think. You would think that because I'm a woman that writing a man's voice would be, you know, such a challenge, but it wasn't. And I realized that writing the man's voice wasn't so difficult because, frankly, we spend a lot of time listening to men. <laughs> like, we are well versed in that point of view. <laughs> but when I wrote it from his point of view all the way through, I felt like it was a familiar story. You know, one man... You know, he's fighting against the system. It's almost like he's been to war and he just wants to come home and find a clean house and a faithful woman, right? Mm. I mean, that was the Odyssey. Mm. And that was written in 70 BC. <laughs> and so I realized that I had a story here about a man who, who has like this kind of classic challenge and his desires are ancient, mm -hmm. but he's in a marriage to a modern woman. So I toggled their two points of view and I liked it better, but I felt like there was so much pressure on Roy's point of view that he was starting to feel symbolic. Like he was starting to feel like the black man. And I think we all have had an experience in our life when we felt more symbolic than actual, whether or not it's a racial thing and you feel like you're um, representing your race, or if you're the only woman in the room, or even when you feel like you're representing your family, you feel like you have to behave in a way that is worthy of that representation. And I felt like it was boxing me in and him in. Mm. And so then when I decided to add the voice of Andre, the other man, just having two men's voices gave each of them more room to be themselves. Mm. And Andre, if you haven't read it, it won't spoil it, I promise. Andre is uh, her uh, Celeste's best friend and lives next door. And it's a love triangle, y'all. It, it does. It does. This. This is sick. Spoiler. <laughs> I, see, I don't think that's a spoiler. No, I don't think, I think that's either. like, obviously. I think that's why you read it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's very true. Well, I was um, hoping, if you don't mind, um, because we talked so much about Celeste that I do have some questions about Celeste a little later, if you could read a little bit from the book, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll read from, I gotta put my glasses on. I have to say that lately, I feel like they've been making the books with smaller and smaller words. <laughs> but I'll just read briefly from when he is, the day that he goes to trial. Hmm. This is Celestial. What I know is this, they didn't believe me. 12 people and not one of them took me at my word. There in the front of the room, I explained that Roy couldn't have raped the woman in room 206 because we had been together. I told them about the magic fingers that wouldn't work, about the movie that played on the snowy television. The prosecutor asked me what we had been fighting about. Rattled, I looked to Roy and to both our mothers. Banks objected so I didn't have to answer, but the pause made it appear that I was concealing something rotten at the pit of our very young marriage. Even before I stepped down from the witness stand, I knew that I had failed him. Maybe I wasn't appealing enough, not dramatic enough, too, not from around here. Who knows? Uncle Banks coaching me had said, now is not the time to be articulate. Now is the time to give it up. No filter, all heart. No matter what you're asked, what you want the jury to see is why you married him. I tried, but... I didn't know how to be anything other than well-spoken in front of strangers. I wish I could have brought a selection of my artwork, the Man Moving series, all images of Roy. I would say, 
this is who he is to me. Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he gentle? But all I had were words which are light and flimsy as air. As I took my seat, not even the black lady juror would look at me. It turns out that I watch too much television. I was expecting a scientist to come and testify about DNA. I was waiting for a pair of handsome detectives to burst into the courtroom at the last minute, whispering something urgent to the prosecutor. Everyone would see that this was a big mistake, a major misunderstanding. We would all be shaken but appeased. I fully believed that I would leave the courtroom with my husband beside me. Secure in our home, we would tell people how no black man is really safe in America but 12 years is what they gave him. We would be 43 when he was released. I couldn't even imagine myself at that age. Roy understood that 12 years was an eternity because he sobbed right there at the defendant's table. His knees gave way and he fell into his chair. The judge paused and demanded that Roy bear this news on his feet. He stood again and cried, not like a baby, but in a way that only a grown man can cry from the bottom of his feet up through his torso and finally through his lips. As Roy howled, my fingers kept wearing a rough patch of skin beneath my chin, a souvenir of scar tissue. When they did what I remember as kicking in the door, what everyone else remembers as opening it with the key, after the door was opened, however it was opened, we were both pulled from the bed. They dragged Roy into the parking lot, and I followed, lunging for him, wearing nothing but a white slip. Someone pushed me to the ground, and my chin hit the pavement. The slip rode up, showing everything to everyone, and my tooth sank into the soft skin of my bottom lip. Roy was on the asphalt beside me, barely beyond my grasp, speaking words that didn't reach my ears. I don't know how long we lay there, parallel like burial plots. Husband, wife, what God has brought together, let no man tear asunder. Yeah. We're just going to fill up on some water and test my pouring skills. Thank you. Um, so I have a question that's a bit personal from, like, personal about me. <laughs> when, when I was growing up, uh, my parents are both American, and um, we, they came to Canada so my dad could play football. And um, we did not talk a lot about race. I was not uh, at all paying attention to politics. And we grew up with the sort of narrative that, like, everything was better in Canada. <laughs> and it wasn't until later that I was, became aware and became interested. But one of the things I was really fascinated about for you, because that's my journey to becoming a writer. So one of my things I was really fascinated about you is that your home was very political from the beginning in sense of your parents talking to you about that. And I wondered about how, how you became a writer in that in that upbringing? Well, you know, I was born, I'm a little older than you, I was born in 1970, so in Atlanta, which is in the South, but it's all, Atlanta is a city that is, was thought to be kind of like the black promised land in mm -hmm. the U.S. We had, a, when I was born, there was a black mayor, black school board president, black police chief, as my daddy would tell all of his friends, because he wanted all of his friends to come move to Atlanta, he would say, oh, we have black everything here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up as, a child in the black everything, and we were constantly being made aware that this, that we had received this, mm. that it felt like being black in that context, um, like my students say, you know, wasn't a bug, it was a feature. Mm. But also, there was a lot going on politically in the news. Like one of my earliest memories as a child was boycotting because of apartheid. Mm. And like my name, Tayari, is Swahili. And there was, you know, a sense, there was the idea that, that one day there would be like this black utopia. And when I was in the ninth grade, my parents, you know how people threaten to leave the country? Like, oh, if Reagan is elected, we're leaving the country. Mm -hmm. They left the country. Mm. <laughs> I spent a couple years in um, Nigeria when I was a kid. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah, so I had very ideal. They were political. And people always think we have political parents, that you have angry parents. Mm. But they were idealistic parents. Mm. But when it came time for me to be a writer, a lot of people rebel against their parents by becoming political. I feel that when I became a writer, I wanted to focus on intensely personal stories. Like An American Marriage is the first novel I've written where I kind of take on 
head-on societal problems. Instead, I felt like as a writer, I was asserting that what happens to our lives personally are important, are just as important as the way our lives look on the big stage. Mm. So I think that as a writer, it didn't, I won't say it didn't make me a political writer, but I think that having that political upbringing made me look for politics elsewhere. Mm. And do you think, was it a challenge writing this book in a different, different way than it was all books or challenges? But did that pose a, a challenge for you when you had this topic that was a bit removed from your life more so than the others and had a theme? Was it, was that separation of plot and character and politics difficult? Well, what I decided when I started writing about Celestial and Roy, separated by his incarceration, what I realized is that their problems were the same as other couples' problems, just turned up. Yeah. Just turned up to 20. Like, the fact that she's an artist and her career is blossoming and her husband's life is, he, his career is not blossoming. He's incarcerated. So that's a unique situation, but it's a very common dynamic in modern marriages. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that made it heartbreaking to me was to realize that they are just like the rest of us. Like it's not like this problem is happening over there mm -hmm. and that they have the same challenges and feelings as anyone else. I think that when you do too much research, you can mess yourself up because you keep wanting to use the research. Mm -hmm. Like you have this great statistic and you just really want a character to turn around and say, did you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I was fortunate enough that so much of my research, I leaned on looking at oral histories of people who are in prison. And all, so, so much of my research were what I like to call details, the minutia of deprivation. Mm. And therefore, I was able to figure out how to convey the emotional experience of prison from my research more so than the hard facts of prison. Mm. Well, one oh, way I got one more thing. I just thought yeah, about this. No, it's fine. You know what was made it easier when I stopped trying to make it about the fact that he was wrongfully incarcerated, mm. because wrongful incarceration doesn't have moral ambiguity. They call it wrongful incarceration because it's wrong. It's wrong. Like <laughs> and so, when you have something morally clear, it boxes you in. So when I made it about what then happens to the marriage, then that was a question that I could explore. Mm. Well, and, and one of the things that I was curious, the title is An American Marriage. But as a black woman, I felt like American, black American marriage is a different challenge than other American marriages. Do you, do you feel that's true? Like, do you think that when you look at marriage, that it's, there's something unique as it relates to the black community in, in the United States? I do think that if something... You know, I had I went back and forth about this title. Mm. It wasn't I came up with it being cute. We were brainstorming for a new title and I said, Oh, we should call it an American marriage, because when you say something is American, it sounds like you're trying to be important. I even I think <laughs> I, I told my editor, I said, Oh my cat, she's writing a memoir, it's called American Feline, you know. <laughs> it's gonna be huge. And he said he liked it and I and I, I resisted it because the title An American Marriage sounded to me like a novel about some white people in Connecticut, <laughs> you know, experiencing emotions. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so I felt like, so I was like, I didn't sound like it was about my characters, but my editor said, you know, Connecticut is such a small state. So <laughs> why do you think what happens in such a small state is more American than what happens to your characters? Mm. And I thought about it and I decided that, you know, I would, that he was right. And that what happened, this conundrum of these characters with the husband being incarcerated in the state of Louisiana, which is the most carceral state in the world, then what happens to them is very uniquely American. Mm. And so when I told my editor, okay, I, I'll accept the title in American marriage. He said, oh, thank goodness. Cause we have already made the cover. <laughs> How long did it take you to accept it? It's a long time. Like mm. it took me like well over a month. I was asking people, I was asking strangers on the subway. I was like, so if someone told you they had written a book called An American Marriage, what would you, wouldn't you think it was about some people in Connecticut? Mm. <laughs> Marketing wise though, doesn't that help if they think it's about? 
I'm going to say no. When you false market a book, you make people mad. Oh, because they feel like they ordered the steak and you served them the salmon. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, it's delicious salmon. They're like, yeah, but it's not what I ordered. Yeah. So yeah, I I think you make a mistake. You can't try to hoodwink your readers with Mm -hmm. your title. Mm -hmm. Well, you've talked a few times tonight about people weighing in in the process of your writing. Is that something you always do? Do you always have other people read and give you comments? Because I know those. I have. I mean, like, you know, you can't write the book alone. And I had a group of friends who would read my work. You know, for years, we've always exchanged work. But I felt like with this book, I don't know. Anybody here in a book club? Have you read this book in a book club? Mm, Lots of book clubbers. Did it get heated? (laughs) It got heated, right? And so I found that I was giving my book to my faithful earlier readers who normally say, good job, keep going, yes. You know, they would have changes, but they approved of the general project. But with this book, when I, was, when I would say, I'm writing a novel about a woman and her husband has been wrongfully incarcerated, everyone thought it was going to be a book about one woman's brave fight to free her man. Mm-hmm. And when it was about these other things, people just got mad. <laughs> And I was finding that it was interrupting my relationships with my friends because they were so mad at me. It was like they were mad at me for even thinking about this book. Mm. And so I had to finally just be alone with the book and try to figure it out without any input. I just had to quietly work on it and try to figure it out myself. I was stranded 50 pages from the end because I couldn't figure out what to do Mm. for a year. Mm. It It was like me and this book were in a relationship in New York and we couldn't afford to move out. So <laughs> like, I felt like the book was on my couch so I couldn't bring any new books home. Mm. It was so stressful until I figured it out. You figured it out, just like, was it like a lightning? Well, what I figured out was this. I was letting Roy as a character tell me what the book was about. Roy is under the impression that the book is about how he, Roy thinks the measure of his story is how he can get back what he lost. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that what he's lost is his job, his woman, his status, his, you know, his marriage. He feels he's lost these things. And he thinks the measure is what he, what the people around him can give him back. Mm -hmm. But it occurred to me that two things, one thing that the thing that was really important that it occurred to me that what he's really lost is his citizenship of his own life. Like we are citizens of our lives based on what we can give. And Mm -hmm. he forgot that that was still his obligation to give. He thought he's been hurt so much that he needed to have things given, that people needed to heal him. He didn't realize that he could give, that he could heal someone else. Mm -hmm. And once I figured that out, I was so excited. He was like, you know, the book is on the couch. I woke it up and I told the book, I figured it out. I figured it out. And I felt Mm -hmm. like he as a character resisted me. I felt like as a character, he felt like, no, this, I'm not giving anyone anything. I've been hurt. Like that Mm -hmm. was his resistance to me trying to push the story in a different direction. But I just went to bed because it was late at night. And when I woke up in the morning, I I put some paper in my typewriter because I write on typewriter. Oh my gosh. And the end, it just came to me and I just wrote, I had to change the ribbon twice because I figured out, I figured out that this is a novel about citizenship and it's a novel about consent. Mm. Well, I won't tell you how it works out, but I'll tell you, it's very interesting to hear that detail. It makes it, sense. It was right? what, well, it was one of my questions. It was like, was it always that ending or did you weigh the different possibilities of what the ending could be? Because I feel like in a book like this, you can sort of, for lack of a better word, send a message with one and like, you know, did you struggle with what that might be? Well, I think the, que- I think the ending of a novel depends on what you decide the question of the novel is, mm-hmm. which I felt like in this novel, I was very trapped by what I call the tyranny of genre expectation. And with this novel being a love triangle, people expect the ending of the book to be who gets the girl. That's mm-hmm. what Roy thinks the book is about, who gets the girl, because that's how love triangles work. But that wasn't the question that I was asking. The question was, for me, was how do we move into the future connected but with pain, yet with hope? Like These were my questions. So I had to just remember what it was that I wanted to know and not lean on questions of genre. Mm. One of the There's a line in the book that says, I think it's Roy that says that only a woman can truly welcome a man home. I think he's been reading the Odyssey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and 
And there's this sense I wanted to ask you, I know there's a lot of conflict around, and I'm sure some of the, the book club discussions are around celestial and around what we expect celestial to do, how we expect celestial to behave. And I know there's larger social questions about what we expect from black women, what we expect them to carry and do. Um, and I wonder how working through how we, what you learned as you were working through this book and hearing other people's questions. I learned that Roy is not the only one that's been reading the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. um, that the fact that he's wrongfully incarcerated, I kind of say when the going gets tough, people get conservative. Because mm -hmm. before, before he's in prison, he liked that she was a busy woman. He liked that she had a career. He liked that she was an artist. He liked that he couldn't control her. But once he's incarcerated wrongfully, he, it's almost like her freedoms and her personality become a luxury they can no longer afford. Mm. And that was something that was, because, okay, even he's wrongfully incarcerated, which is an extreme situation, but I also think that's a larger cultural question for black women. There's a sense that because our community is under siege in so many ways that we can't afford feminism. Mm. That that's, you know, that we all have to come together to help heal and save you know, the men who are experiencing such violence, because I consider incarceration to be a kind of violence. But what does that mean if feminism is a luxury? What does it mean if your life is in a way that freedom is a luxury? Mm. I was really wondering why I had read so few novels about black women in marriage that ask questions about, like, if there's a novel about a black woman and she's unsatisfied in her marriage, it will be because she's in a dangerous or violent marriage, right? The marriage has to be horrible for the narrative to say you have a right to your own mm. agenda, your own freedoms. And I noticed there were a lot of novels by white women that questioned this, but I realized that the novels by white women, the men were never in trouble. Mm. So when the white woman in the novel walks away from a marriage, you don't feel that she's leaving ruin behind her. Mm. And that was the difference with Celestial being a black woman. It was like she... The bar of what can, what makes her selfish is so much lower than the bar for what makes other people selfish. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the questions. And I was also thinking about what is it that, like so many people read it as though she has abandoned him, even though she clearly says, I'm not abandoning you. I will continue to pay, my, pay the lawyer to fight for your release. I'll continue to do this. But because she cannot pledge her fidelity as a wife, mm. he feels as though she's done nothing. And I do feel there's this sense that if you don't do everything, people treat you like you've done nothing. Mm. Mm -hmm. right, <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel, do you feel like you have to defend Celestial a lot when you're traveling and answering questions? It depends. You know, some, I did go this, I, I have had situations where I got heckled. Mm. Wow. I know people I'm like since when do people heckle writers? <laughs> it took me a good like three or four instances before I was like, oh, I'm being heckled. And I didn't have anything in my toolkit on what to do when being heckled. Mm. But this woman was heckling me. She was saying, You take care of your man no matter what. You take care of that man. No matter I tried to talk to someone else and she just kept coming back. It was not cute. What did you do? What did you say? I don't know. I mean, she was. What was I going? What should I have I done? Know. I, I don't thought know. She, I was. I was. Luckily, there was a little remove of the stage, so she couldn't like get at me. But I realized how passionate, how how threatened the storyline was. I mean, I did try to say, "Lady, these aren't real people," you know. <laughs> yeah, she was not impressed with that. She was. I felt like because she felt like she was looking into my heart. Like she felt that that yet yeah, that my book did not prioritize the right things. Mm. Such a powerful thing when someone gets that angry over the characters. <laughs> I feel like you've done something right when somebody is that like invested in what your character should do. It's That's because she wasn't heckling you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> if she was heckling me, I would have gone back to my hotel room and probably cried. Yeah, I was, like, I was really a little taken aback. Like yeah. I had never, I had never had. I mean, that is one of the things too that because this book has reached such a wide audience. Before my earlier books, I would give a reading like I would think I would always say anything over 12 people, anything more than a dozen is a success. That's mm -hmm. what I would always say. And so and if so, the dozen people would show up only, you know, if someone doesn't like your book, they're not normally going to get dressed, put on some shoes, get in their car and come tell you. <laughs> right? 
it's a, it's a very outlier thing. But when your readership gets larger, it increases the likelihood mm. that you will have such a person. So that yeah. has been such a different thing for me on this, on this book tour of having the larger the audience, the more diversity of thought in the audience. Mm. I have a personal question that I wrestled with as I was reading and I was trying to be really smart and clever. And then I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to ask her about it on stage so that I can resolve this. So it's really fascinated with, <laughs> I was, I was, I, I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to shout about stand by your man. That is not it at all. I'm really curious about the dolls. Okay. I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I was very curious about the dolls and whether there was like a, a, a symbolism behind the dolls or whether the dolls were just the dolls or whether you have like some background in doll making that you wanted to put in the book. The dolls fascinated me. Okay, all of the, all of the above. Really? Yes. Okay, we'll go. Let's see what's the best way to go. I was interested in the dolls because I wanted to write about a woman who's an artist. And part of the challenge of being... So I, sorry, I should have prefaced the question, but Celeste, for those of you who haven't read, Celestial makes dolls, and she makes dolls that look like real people, and she sells them for a lot of money. Not a lot well, of money. She's got a shop. and then I feel like so defensive. Like, she doesn't make a lot of money. She <laughs> makes her, she It's makes, not like those dolls that you, like, sew with yarn and sell for, like... Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. She makes her living as an artist. Yeah. And she has two types of dolls she makes. She makes the really high art ones that go in museums, and people do commission for lots of money, but then she makes ones that can be bought, mm. you know, so... Because to me, it's a question of the artist, right? Like, the dolls she makes that are for museums, they're dolls, but no one will ever hug them. Mm. You know, and then are you really making art if people can't, can't hug it in a way? And I think that's one of the questions about art in general. But also as a woman artist, she makes dolls. They are high art, but people regard them as toys for girls. Mm. And I feel that that's true for all women's art. Like I think of myself, like sometimes I'm on a plane, I'm on my way somewhere, and I'll be sitting next to a man and he'll say, you know, so what do you do? I'll say, oh, I'm a writer, I'm on a book tour. Oh, he said, do you write romance novels? And I'll say, I'll say, no, I don't write romance novels. I wrote a novel, um, I wrote a novel that I was about. He says, oh, that sounds great. I'll buy it for my wife. Mm. Happens to me all the time. And he's not trying to hurt my feelings. He understands that whatever intellectual product I have is for his wife. It's not anything that he would engage with. And he doesn't think that I should think so. Like he... Mm. And I think that's also true with the doll making, right? Like he's making dolls and it's thought of in a certain, she's thought of in a certain way. Mm. So that's one. Two, symbolically also, there's so much talk about babies and making babies mm -hmm. and things in this. So I like that echo through. And I also like the dolls as to show that she is thinking of Roy, mm. you know? And also, who do we own our own image? Even as a writer, when you write characters that remind people of themselves, do they get mad? Sometimes. Yes, but, but I haven't done fiction yet, so I've only been telling like true stories about my family, which is But terrible. they get, it's a weird thing because <laughs> I have a friend who is always saying, I'm stealing what he's saying. And I'm like, I'm not stealing. You're still saying it. You still have it. But, <laughs> but there is that sense as an artist, when you mine the people around you for your art, mm -hmm. what are the ethics of that? So Roy gets so angry when she makes a doll that looks like him. But he used to like it that she made dolls that looked like him. So all of that was part of it. And my personal experience with doll making is that I have a friend who makes dolls and her dolls are so beautiful. And she has to like wear magnifying glasses to sew little beads on. And here's my favorite story of this. She made a doll. It was very ornate. There were a lot of specifications. The person who ordered it wanted the doll to wear a skirt with 25 layers, and each layer should have a word like peace, joy, love. Oh my gosh. She, it took years. It was made. A chauffeur picked it up. You know, he had on the hat with the braid, you know, took the doll away. We never knew who, who the doll was for. Well, <laughs> I was on the Instagram, and I was looking through, and I saw a beautiful Thanksgiving table, you know, candles, chandeliers. And behind the table was a built-in shelves, you know? Yeah. And sitting on the shelf was the doll. I was like, it's, that's the doll. I, you know, blew it up. It was the doll. Guess whose house it was? It was Oprah's house. Oh, my God! <laughs> I think someone gave it to her as a gift for her 25th. That's why everything was made on, remember when she ended her show after 25 years? Oh, my That's why gosh. everything was made on 25.
I'm I think so we drink some water now. <laughs> I am like officially speechless. I will think about, and I want to read the book all over again and think about <laughs> Oprah's doll. <laughs> So should we ask about Oprah? I'm sure somebody wants to know how the whole, so I posted a picture this week of you with Oprah and people, my friends were like, you are interviewing Oprah. And I'm like, close, Terry Jones in the picture. So I'm like now one degree of separation from me and Oprah, all of us from meeting you. Um, so yeah, what was that like? Well, this was before the book came out. So I mean, we hadn't had any early reviews or anything, but Oprah had a copy of the manuscript because Oprah is Oprah. <laughs> and I think that one of the many joys and pleasures of being Oprah, there must be so many, one of them <laughs> is that she makes the call herself to tell you she's chosen her book, oh your God. book. So I'm driving the car, minding my business, and the phone rang and it was a block call. I answer block calls because I am nosy. And <laughs> I feel like that person blocked the call for a reason. Every block call is a story. So I, I said, hello. And the voice on the other end said, hi, this is Oprah. <laughs> so I put on my hazard lights. I pulled over. And I'm from Georgia. And Oprah was born in Mississippi. So I said, ma'am. And she said, I read your book, and I would like to use it for my book club. What do you think about that? And I said, yes, ma'am. I think that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's a great story. We are about to open it up for questions from the larger group. Um, I wanted to ask one other question about the, the setting for the story, because your previous novels have been set in Atlanta, where... Um, you've talked about, but we have this imagined or fictional town of Elo that also becomes an important place. And I was wondering why, why a fictional place in Louisiana? Was there something you wanted to do in uh, or comment on in that? Um, yeah, I was interested in the setting, if that was always clear to you that it was going to be Atlanta and Louisiana and that was going to be a pull. Well, you know, I'm, I'm from Atlanta, born and raised. My daddy is from a small town in Louisiana mm. called Oakdale. And Daddy always understood himself as kind of an immigrant to the big city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. People think about the black migration as being from the south to the north, mm -hmm. but a lot of people migrated to the urban centers of the south, to Atlanta, to Houston. Mm -hmm. And because they're southerners and they like being in the south, mm -hmm. but they wanted to go where there was more opportunity, particularly more opportunity as a black person. So I modeled Elo on the town where my daddy grew up, where I would be, um, I would spend all my summers there. And there also is a very large prison right up the road. And everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people who live in the town, they, they have loved ones in the prison mm -hmm. and they work in the prison. So the prison is just such a part of life there. Mm -hmm. I chose to call it Elo because Toni Morrison in her novel Tar Baby, she has a town called Elo where the, mm -hmm. the love interest He's from Elo, and he's nostalgic about his hometown. Mm -hmm. And I, I love Toni Morrison. I love her so much. And I feel that everything I write, I try to put a little, I try to write a love letter in my book so mm. that maybe she'll get it one day. She'll know. <laughs> I, I want her to know that I'm serious. Mm. Mm. And it forms, it ends up forming a little bit of a triangle in itself, those settings, Atlanta and Elo and the penitentiary. And so I really liked how that worked together with the characters um, going through that as well. So so nice to know Tony made her way in. <laughs> I love her so much that on my desk where I write, I have a little tiny jar of dirt from the yard of where she grew up. Mm. And I, I just, sometimes I shake it like a little maraca. And, <laughs> but if I have a student who's having a really hard time with their work, it, rarely I might get a little pinch. Mm. <laughs> it so helps. Great. 